morning I want to address a particular problem. That is what we might do as Christians with those who see themselves as alumni of the Christian faith. Of course, I'm not referring to those who have been translated by death from what Christians call the church militant into the church triumphant. I mean, rather, those here on earth who once believed that Christ and his shed blood freely justified them before God, forgave their sin, gave them eternal life. But now they do not believe that. It seems to me that in the gospel accounts, virtually every person who rejected Jesus' claim to be God and Messiah, the Savior of the world, went away either sad or mad. First, I'm going to try to deal with today's sad ones, the longing, having given up on it all ones. And then second, I want to talk a little about the gospel of Christ for today's mad ones, angry ones. I can't tell you how much it bugs me that there exists such a group as the one called Fundamentalists Anonymous. But there is such a self-help group. If there's a recovery group, group in the case of Christianity, I want it to be Liberal Protestants Anonymous, or Recovering Neo-Orthodox Protestants, or Liberation Theology Advocates Anonymous, or the Open Theism Recovery Group. You get the idea. For all of its faults, American fundamentalism at least is Christianity of a sort. But still, to be perfectly honest, I really can understand why such a group as Fundamentalists Anonymous exists. And many of these people about whom I'm going to speak today are casualties of Bible-believing churches. Some seem able to remain in this form of Christianity for years and years but certainly not all. For some reasons that I think are very specifiable, more than we would like to think leave fundamentalist Christianity. And I think the same uh, dynamic is often the case with people who belong to what are called the holiness bodies, Wesleyan Christianity. Some are sad about it, some are mad. You say to me, well, my church is certainly not fundamentalist. I think mine is part of what Newsweek and Time call mainline. <clears throat> if that is the case, probably not much that I have to say today will be very helpful to you. I'm not going to be talking much about mainline churches, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopal, for the simple reason that for most of them, there isn't enough theology left to make people really sad or mad make them convinced that they have to leave or their hearts will break, or make them leave it because if they don't, they will uncork on one of the clergy and get arrested for it. There isn't enough theology in most mainline churches today to upset anybody. There isn't much of anything left in American mainline Protestant churches except maybe lessons in ethics, perhaps some opportunities for social service. As one wag put it, the trouble with theology today is that there isn't any. Many of us as Christians have met and talked with sad alumni of Christianity. And many of us have also met and talked with some of the mad alumni of Christianity. The venue may vary, but most of us know or have met men and women who tell us that Christianity once was a part of their life in years past, but that they no longer consciously identify with Jesus Christ or with any form of Christianity. Every pastor runs into these people. It seems to go with the territory. But so do you and I know them, meet them. I've run into it in decades of working on the college campus, first with the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, later as a professor. In those roles, it has been, I think, easier for students to tell me the truth for whatever reasons. I think they have said things to me that they were afraid to tell their pastors or priests. It is perhaps easier to tell a professor that you once believed in Jesus, but that you don't now, or that you wish you could still believe in Jesus, but you just can't anymore. And if you're a layman or a laywoman, you've probably heard the same thing from friends or acquaintances. In our day, there are so many of these people that it's hard not to come into contact with them. 
Let's talk first about the sad alumni. Many of these people were broken by the church. I know that sounds harsh. As Christians, it's upsetting to hear words like that, but for many people, this is how they really see what has taken place in their lives. Now, certainly many of us have had contact with people who have struggled for their whole lives with be, being deeply upset psychologically. Commonly, the church draws ones whom the professionals recognize as bipolar. Is that a na new name for what we used to call manic depressive? Or we have met or know people whose guilt is so great that they are immobilized within. Same with people who are inwardly so frightened that just coping day by day is truly heroic. It is not about such people that I will be speaking today. I'm not competent to do so. And it seems to me that such people deserve all of the care and empathy that we can muster. But again, it is not about such people that I will be speaking today. <clears throat> by the sad alumni of the Christian faith, I mean the hundreds and hundreds whose acquaintance with the Christian church was often one in which they were helped to move from unbelief or from a suffocating moralism into real saving faith in Jesus Christ. They heard the preaching of God's law and then heard the announcement of Christ's work on their behalf on the cross. Jesus, as the God-man who met the law's demands for them and died for their sin, died to save them, died to give them eternal life. They heard the wonderful message of God's grace in Christ. They heard the astonishing news that forgiveness is free in Jesus Christ. They heard that Christ's blood redeems sinners, redeems them completely. And they came to believe that Christianity is not so much about what is in their hearts as much as it is about what is in God's heart and proven by Christ's vicarious and atoning death for them for their sin, and they came to believe that the cross of Christ was their salvation. But something happened after that, something that broke them. And in general, I think what happened is nameable, at least in many cases. In my Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, we would speak of it as the confusion of law and gospel. Dr. Charles Mansky, the founding president of Christ College Irvine, used to teach a course in Christianity for freshmen. In that course, he characterized the various churches of Christendom this way. Rome, law. Lutheran, law, gospel. Wesleyan, evangelical, law, gospel, law. I think Dr. Mansky was definitely on to something here, and I think it is that third point that results in a lot of sad alumni of Christianity. <clears throat> Now, if you are Lutheran or Reformed, we both have a category that, if not done carefully and well, will turn out just as destructive as any Wesleyan, Pentecostal, or Nazarene preaching. I am referring, of course, to the third use of the law. In Lutheran theology, the content of this third use of the law is spelled out in a section of our Book of Concord, uh, specifically in that section titled The Formula of Concord. If you're a reform, you will recognize this category immediately, recognize that it is tracing back to John Calvin himself, and, if I'm correct, in what you call the three forms of unity. What do Reformation folk mean by the third use of the law? It claims to be simply informative for the Christians, something which fleshes out what is the will of God for me as a Christian. What about the law thundering to us that we are deeply fallen and unable to fix our problem? That we are guilty before a holy God and his holy law? That unless God does something one-sidedly to rescue us, we are without hope and certainly condemned? That we from the Reformation call the second use of the law, the theological use. Luther thought this aspect was the major function of the law in all of the Bible, to drive us to Christ as the substituting lamb for your sin and for mine. At any rate, if we Reformation folk do the third use of the law badly, we get very close to the infamous application section of the sermon so common in Wesleyan and evangelical preaching. 
And if we do it badly, the sensitive Christian believer can be driven to a slavery as bad as any slavery done by any totalitarian dictator. If the Ten Commandments were not impossible enough, the preaching of Christian behavior, of Christian ethics, of Christian living can drive a Christian into despairing unbelief. Not happy unbelief, tragic, despairing, sad unbelief. It's not unlike the unhappy Christian equivalent of Jack Mormons, those who finally admit to themselves and others that they can't live up to the demands of this non-Christian cult's laws and excuse themselves from the whole shebang. In a Christian, con a Christian context, the mechanism of this is actually very simple. You come to believe that you have been justified freely because of Christ's shed blood. Freely, for the sake of Jesus' innocent sufferings and death, God has forgiven you your sin, adopted you as a son or daughter, given you the Holy Spirit, reconciled you to himself and all the rest. Verses like, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, seem at first read to be possible now that you've been so equipped. Or you hear Paul as he writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Same thing. You realize that you might have had some excuse for failure when you were a pagan, but that's over. Now you've been made a part of God's family, have been, become a re, the recipient of a thousand of his free gifts, and then the unexpected. Sin continues to be a part of your life. Stubbornly won't allow you to eliminate the, it the way you expected. Continuing sin on your and my part seems to be just evidence that we aren't really believers at all. We start to imagine that we need to be born again again. Now, how do I know this one from the inside? You might be able to tell that I don't have to search for words on this one, and you're right. I was brought up in a pietistic Norwegian Lutheran church. For those of you who haven't heard the term, pietism began with certain Lutherans in Germany, Arndt and Spener and others, who wanted a more living Christianity than seemed to be taught and encouraged in their Lutheran parishes in Germany. But it was as close as Lutherans in Germany, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and America came to being just like Biola or Wheaton. The Reformation emphasis on Christ outside of us, dying for us, and on the justification of sinners gratis was de-emphasized. Instead, the emphasis shifted to the individual's experience of conversion and to the victorious life of the true Christian day by day. My church's pietism made me an agnostic by the time I was a senior in high school. How so? Well, imagine a Sunday school curriculum filled with Bible stories designed to teach a moral point with every single lesson. Beware Sunday school curricula. That stuff is dangerous to children. One of the happiest days of my life was the morning when standing in the church narthex, my wonderful father delivered me out of Sunday school. Uh, I remember to this day where I stood, where he stood. I even remember which sport coat he was wearing. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, how was Sunday school? And I said, okay. And he could hear behind that. He said, how would you like to quit? I said, Dad, I'd love to quit Sunday school. He said, well, why don't you just stop going? Come in with me into the adult study. Now, I didn't understand one twentieth of what was going on there. All I knew was that he had delivered me with a single stroke out of the hands of gray-haired women trying to make me more moral <laughs> and using Bible stories to do it. It was like escape from prison. He had again made my life happier, and it was not the last time by any measure either. Now, even though I'm not Reformed, and I don't speak Reformed very well, let me see if I can use a couple of categories from the Heidelberg Catechism to guess how you might have the same dynamic and its problems, at least when executed badly. Think of the paradigm guilt, grace, gratitude. Don't you Reformed have the same sort of problems that we Lutherans had with pietism 
at least when the paradigm is executed badly? If I'm elect and regenerate, why is it that my gratitude is so small, so lacking on a daily basis? The hurrier I go, the behinder I get. Or, if I really were elect, my life would certainly reflect that fact more than it does. Or, maybe I'm just fooling myself. I'm not really of the elect, and I know that because the peace, the joy, the confidence Paul says the Christian is have, I don't have. I'd be lying if I said I did. Close quote. And for those of you who are Wesleyans, you are in this mess up to your armpits. Wesley's charge to his pastors was very clear. They were called, one, to evangelize pagans, something for which Wesley gets an A in my book, and two, to urge their parishioners on to Christian perfection, something for which I would give Wesley an F if he were in one of my classes. If it's of any comfort to you Wesleyans, you can blame us Lutherans for a lot of this stuff. We Missouri Lutherans try to blame it on the Strasbourg Reformed, uh, blame Lutheran pietism on the Strasbourg Reform, but I'm not so sure we wouldn't have done it all on our own steam. Through Nicholas von Zinzendorf and Herrenhut and Peter Böhler, we Lutherans bequeathed a lot of this mess of pietism to Wesley. Read the story in any biography of Wesley. In fact, we Lutherans managed to corrupt all sorts of denominations with the skubala. You can look that up in Greek. It's nicely translated dung. <laughs> of pietism. Not just our own Lutheran churches, but also the free churches, the Brothers Wesley, Cotton Mather in the New World, about Jonathan Edwards, I don't know. This stuff knew and knows almost no bounds. For our purposes... This morning, the upshot is always the same. Broken, sad ex-Christians who despair of being able to live the Christian life as the Bible describes it. So they do what is really a sane thing to do. They leave. The way it looks to them is that the message of Christianity has broken them on the rack. To put it bluntly, it feels better to have some earthly happiness as a pagan and then be damned than it feels to be trying every day as a Christian to do something that is one continuous failure and then be damned. Trust me on this one. This is how things look. It seems to me that the key question here is a very basic one. Can the cross and blood of Christ save a Christian, failing as he or she is in living the Christian life? Or no? Most of us would say, I hope, that the shed blood of Christ is sufficient to save a sinner. All by itself, just Christ's blood, nude faith in it, sola fide, faith without works, a righteousness of God apart from law, a cross by which God justifies wicked people, and so forth. So far, so good? But is the blood of Christ enough to save a still sinful Christian, or isn't it? Does the gospel still apply even if you're a Christian, or doesn't it? It seems to me, one, that the category sinner still applies to me, two, that the category sinner still applies to you, and three, that the category sinner still applies to all Christians. If you're a Wesleyan and have reached perfection, what I say here doesn't, of course, apply to you. <laughs> but for the rest of us, it seems that what Luther said of the Christian being simultaneously sinner and justified before the Holy God is critical. Is what Luther said biblical? Or isn't it? Is it biblical to say that a Christian is simul justus et peccator or no? Are we Christians saved the same way we were when we were baptized or when we came to acknowledge Christ's shed blood and his righteousness as all we've got in the face of God's holy law? And that all of our supposed virtue, Christian or pagan, is just like as what the Bible calls old menstrual garments. Are Christians still saved that freely or aren't we? We're pretty clear that imputed righteousness saves sinners. But can imputed righteousness save a Christian? 
And can it save him or her all by itself or no? I think the way we answer this question determines whether we have anything at all to say to the sad alumni of Christianity. Will imputed righteousness save failing Christians or won't it? Now, we Lutheran pastors haven't done a great job of getting across the central message of righteousness by imputation alone. I hope you've done a better job at it than we have. A gigantic survey years ago showed that we Lutheran pastors haven't even convinced our own members of the sufficiency of Christ's cross and blood. And I mean members who might never have attended a revival, might never have spent five minutes watching crazy Trinity Broadcasting Network. The book was called A Study of Generations. And what it showed us was that 75% of the Lutheran laity, regardless of synod, gave perfect Roman Catholic answers. When you die, are you sure you will enter heaven? Answer, I hope so. <laughs> if you do get in, how will you get in? I tithe, my wife and I tithed most of our adult Christian life. Both of us sang in the choirs in several congregations. We taught Sunday school. I myself was president of three separate congregations. Perfect Roman Catholic answers. What the sad alumni of Christianity need to hear, perhaps for the first time, is that Christian failures are going to walk into heaven, be welcomed into heaven, leap into heaven like a calf leaping out of its stall, laughing and laughing as if it's all too good to be true. It isn't just that we failures will get in, it's that we will probably get in like that. We failures in living the Christian life as described in the Bible will probably say something like, you mean it was really all that simple? Just Christ's cross and blood? Just his righteousness imputed to my account as if mine? You've got to be kidding. And all of heaven is ours just because of what was done by Jesus outside of me on the cross, not because of what Christ ever did in me, in my heart, in my Christian living, in my behavior? Well, I'll be damned. But of course, that's just the point, isn't it? As a believer in Jesus, you won't be damned. No believer in Jesus will be, not a single one. As C.S. Lewis put it, there are going to be a lot of surprises at the eschaton. There are going to be people there that we just don't imagine will be there. Think of the non-Israelite that C.S. Lewis purposely put in heaven at the end of his The Last Battle. Boy, did that ever get the goat of some Christians. But you read what Aslan said to him. I suppose you're wondering why you're here. Answer, yes, sir. And then he tells him why. There are going to be believers in Jesus who never darkened the door of a church. That's no encouragement not to attend, not to be baptized, not to receive the Lord's Supper. It's just saying that faith in Jesus saves. Saves all by itself, nude, apart from works. There are going to be scads of Roman Catholics, people who never listened really to the theology preached by their priests, but just believed in the sufficiency of Jesus' blood, no matter what the priest was preaching. People of all sorts who just believed in Jesus and his blood shed for them, for complete payment of all of their sin. There are going to be call girls, there are going to be drug dealers, maybe even a couple of lawyers. <clears throat> there are going to be members of the cults who never really got what the cult leaders taught, but just trusted that Jesus' blood and cross was for their sin and for their hatred of God, for their wickedness. Surprises. Lots of surprises. It bugs me to say it, but there might even be a couple of IRS employees, <laughs> maybe a congressman or congresswoman. Everyone has some class of people they really don't want to die as believers in Jesus. Those are mine. <laughs> but to put it closer to home, there might even be a theologian or two who believed in Jesus. <laughs> Bet the blue chips on the blood of Jesus and nothing else or in addition to that blood. There might even be a despicable leftist socialist college professor or two, academics who daily sold out the wonderful American Constitution and instead filled their students' heads with status drivel and mush. 
Cowards, scum, bottom of the barrel, reprehensibles, jerks, deadbeat dads, murderers, all sorts of rabble. And they died believing in Jesus and his blood as their only hope. Ask yourself, is sola fide true or is sola fide not true in the case of failing Christians? Is Paul's letter to the Galatians true or no? And if Galatians is true, and it most certainly is, but an apologia for that is not our subject today, can a failing Christian be saved simply by the cross and blood of Christ? Or can he or she not be so saved just by Christ's blood? If you answer yes, he or she can, well, that's the message that's gotten lost on most Jack Christians, at least the ones I've met. Many times the law has already ready done its work on them. Boy, has it ever done its work on them. They, they need more law like they need a hole in the head. The law was and is killing them. True, Paul says, the law kills. He writes as if that is what the law is for. The law is designed to crush, to crush human pride and supposed self-sufficiency toward God. It is intended to kill, designed to kill. The biblical connection is law-sin. What gives sin its power is the law. And more so, the law is designed to make the problem worse. It is to be gasoline on an already blazing fire. Want to have sin run out of control? Go to a church in which the law is preached, and then the law is preached again and more stringently and deeply, and then the law is preached even more. Think of John Lithgow's portrayal years ago of a law-preaching pastor in the film Footloose. Didn't you just cringe? I mean, even if you're a Southern Baptist, you had to cringe at that character. Drawing the Christian line in the sand at the possibility of a high school dance? Lithgow could not listen to his daughter even if hearing her would have instantly resulted in world peace. Man, was he righteous. In Footloose, Lithgow's wife should have been the pastor. Don't quote me. <laughs> I could be thrown out of the Missouri Center for even joking about such a thing. You Missouri Lutherans, that's a joke. <laughs> Chill out. Or as Phil Hendry says in the ad, it wouldn't hurt you to laugh. You non-Lutherans, all of this is an inside joke. Ask your Lutheran friends why that's a joke in our circles. My point, though, is that the whole film, Footloose, was Jesusless. No cross, no atonement, nothing of Christianity, really. Same as chariots of fire. Completely Christless, completely gospelless. Back to the point. For many of the Jack Christians we've met, the law is all their ears ever heard. For them, the gospel often got lost in a whole bunch of Christian life preaching and it did them in. And so they left. And deep down there's a sadness in these people that defies description. If you and I don't understand, understand that, we should. They were crestfallen, so great their hopes and so devastating the failure. C.F.W. Walther said uh, that as soon as the law has done its crushing work, the gospel is to be instantly preached or said to such a man or woman. Instantly. Walther said that in the very moment that the pastor senses that the law has done its killing work, he is to placard Christ and his cross and his blood to the trembling, the despairing, and the broken. Be of good cheer, my son, your sins are forgiven. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Fear not, little flock, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. And he, when he comes, will neither break the bruised reed nor quench the smoldering wick. When you come back, when you return, remember me. I tell you, this day you shall be with me in paradise. It is finished. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. 
God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that faith not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And to the man who does not work, but trusts the one who justifies wicked people, his, his faith is counted as if it were righteousness. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. But now a righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and so forth. Secondly, let's talk about those alumni of Christianity who are not sad but mad. It's not all that uncommon. I find that these angry ones have usually not switched from Christianity to another religion. Nor have I found that they have switched from one Christian denomination to another. Instead, I find that they are angry at any and all religions and anyone who represents any religious, religious position, but especially Christianity. And that is natural. After all, it was Christianity as they see it that used them up and threw them away. I suppose the most visible examples would be men like the late comedian Sam Kinison, and ex-Roman Catholic George Carlin. You may and probably do know better contemporary examples than I. All of us are in the vicinity of people like this at one time or another, maybe know a few of them, or have at least met one or two in passing. Why do I say that? Because such people are, as I said, not all that uncommon these days. Now, I certainly can't this morning exhaust the dynamic involved in such people. Again, I'm no clinical psychologist. But I still think a lot of the mad alumni also often have a nameable history, just as the sad alumni have one. People like this often speak as if Christianity baited and switched them, just like a used car salesman baits and switches a young couple at a car lot. Christians promised them a new life in Christ in such a way that it was going to be a life of victory God's designed route to earthly happiness, a new divine power that would solve the problems so obsessing them. Then, when the promises didn't seem to work the way they were supposed to, the church put it back on these believers that they were somehow not doing it right. They weren't reading their Bibles enough. They weren't praying enough or praying right. They weren't attending enough church meetings. They weren't making right use of the fellowship. You name the prescription. You fill in the blanks any way you want to. Some pastor or layman told them that Christianity was failing them because they weren't doing it right. And often these believers took that counsel to heart and set themselves to trying to do it better or do it right so that it would work. But again, Christianity seemed not to deliver on its promises. It didn't work. As they see it, they gave it every shot, and Christianity failed to deliver. And then they were called guilty for not doing it right to boot. These people feel not just disappointed, they feel betrayed, they feel conned, and they are deeply angry about it. Or take another example. Those who heard much of Christ and his saving blood or cross in an evangelistic meeting and became Christians and then heard very little of that wonderful message in the week-by-week -week pulpit ministries of their congregations. Instead, they heard recipes as to how to conquer sin, over and over and over and over. These people also often give up on Christianity, and they are angry about it, really angry. And I don't blame them, really, nor should you. The church has an obligation to preach the gospel to these people on a weekly basis. 
and deep down they somehow know that. But if that isn't what happens, they react, and I would too. After all, what does the church have for a man, a woman, a child, other than Christ and his work on their behalf? Not much. Not compared to being absolved, not compared to eating the body of Christ given into death for their sin, and drinking the blood of Christ shed for their sin. Not compared to the gospel of Christ crucified for them and for their sin, Christ risen from the dead for their justification. Is there anything we can do that is of genuine help to such angry alumni of Christianity? I think so. And the answer I'm about to give you comes right from a guy close to one of those angry ones. From whom? From Sam Kinison's brother. How so? One night, years ago, I happened to be watching a 60 Minutes interview with Kinison's brother. After Sam was killed in an auto accident on some highway near Las Vegas, he describes that as he, uh, his brother lay dying, he was cradling Sam's head in his arms. The interview, interviewer asked Sam's brother about Sam's hatred of Christianity. And his brother looked at the interviewer and said, what? You think Sam was not a Christian believer? You're wrong. Sam died as a believer in Jesus Christ. You'll definitely see Sam in heaven. You see, Sam was never angry with Jesus. He was angry at the church. And I jumped out of my chair and I yelled, that's it, there it is. There's the answer from Sam Kinison's brother. What did I mean, that's it? We can respond to the angry and say something like, Oh, I see. You're not angry at Jesus Christ. You're angry at the church. Boy, oh boy, join the club. So am I, and so are a whole bunch of other Christians too. Now, this response takes more than a few minutes of thought on our part. That is, am I ready to say such a thing? And that's not an easy question. For many of us, especially us clergy, given the predictable profile of the clergy with their close relationship with their mothers and not with their fathers, this question can be really difficult. For most of us pastors, the link between Jesus and the church, a mother symbol, is so tight, so identical, that to be angry with mother church is the same as being angry with Jesus. But I'm recommending, at least in conversations with the angry, that we, all of us, identify with the anger of these people at the church, that we say, well, of course you are. I just thought you were angry with Christ. Now, I know that's tough. Again, it raises questions in us that are not easy ones, particularly for us pastors who are closer to mom than to dad. And unfortunately, that's most of us. But I recommend we take the hit. It's not unlike the case with something like the Crusades or the Inquisition. I think most of us don't want to defend everything the church has done in the past. And believe me, the angry alumni are listening closely to see whether we're going to defend the church as much as we defend the gospel. I recommend that we do not defend the church as much as we defend the gospel. I recommend that we immediately cop to the horrendous things done by the church in the past. And for those of you who are Lutheran, this is not the time to catechize this guy into the finer points of Luther's two kingdoms theory. Let me illustrate with a couple of particularly embarrassing examples examples in my own church's history. Believe me, you've got some parallels in your church too, no matter which church you belong to. One of the lowest points in Lutheran church history has to do with both the peasants' revolt and with our persecution of the Anabaptists in the 16th century. The peasant revolt had frightened Luther to death. Luther deeply feared anarchy. In a letter to the German princes, Luther ordered them to use the sword and to slay anyone who was out on the streets behaving like a revolutionary. He quickly wrote a letter that appealed to the princes to ignore his first letter, but it was too late. The peasants, thinking that Luther was backing them, were astounded when they learned that Luther had ordered the princes to cut, slash, and kill them. A real dark chapter in my church's history. In a similar way, to the degree to which Anabaptist Christians represented any sort 
of spirit-given ecclesiastical anarchy, one that had no place for church order, Luther unleashed on them, too. Lutherans okayed baptizing such people by immersion for about 10 minutes. The Reformed and the Roman Catholics went along with us in this, but I'm just speaking about my own church here. Reprehensible? You bet. Do I want to defend such executions to one of these angry uh, at the church? Not a chance. Hate it as I might, I need to agree with the person with whom I'm speaking. Same thing with some of the anti-Semitic things Luther wrote in his later life. Uh, by the way, if your kids are in the government propaganda warehouses, what we used to call the public schools, don't be surprised if this is the only factoid about Luther that they learn there, that Luther wrote some awful anti-Semitic things. If we were in another context tonight, a secular context, I'd say the same thing regarding what they learn about Thomas Jefferson. It is entirely possible that the only factoid your children will learn in the so-called schools is that Jefferson fathered a child by one of his slave girls. Further uh, research has shown that might not have occurred. It might have been his brother. Nothing about his warnings and his arguments about the danger of a large, powerful, centralized federal government. Nope. But they will probably learn that he still owned slaves and worse, fathered a child by one of them. But I digress. I said that I recommend that we cop to some of the evil things the church has done. We might be tempted to start by trying to balance the charges. That is, mention the wonderful things the church has sometimes done. Uh, Al Schmidt's book. I recommend in these cases against that too, at least in this kind of evangelistic or apologetic conversation. But since hearing Sam Kinison's brother, I don't want to leave the matter there. You and I copying to the evil done by the church still leaves the angry one satisfied in his antichristic state and still miles from the gospel. If the law has done its work on him, I want to talk to this guy about the gospel. I want to talk about Jesus' claims, and if I can, particularly about Jesus' claims regarding what he was going to do for sinners, including me and including him, on the cross. Now, you Lutheran pastors, don't talk to me at this point about the scriptural truths he might or must learn in a pastor's inquirer's class about sacraments. This kind of guy isn't going to come to your pastor's inquirer's class to learn about sacraments or to learn about anything else. He's too angry. Same for you Reformed pastors. This is not the time to start talking to this guy about the scriptural truths he might learn in your pastor's inquirer's class about the finer points of predestination. This kind of a guy isn't going to come to your pastor's inquirer's class to learn about election or to learn about anything else. He's too angry. So what am I going to do? I'm going to talk about the gospel as if it can be believed in totally apart from the church. You say to me, Rosenblatt, that isn't how scripture presents the church. I answer, first things first. This guy needs Christ. Christ as priest. Christ as having bled for his sin. Christ as giving eternal life to sinners for free. And in his mind, the church is what is keeping him or her away from Jesus Christ. If he comes to trust Christ and Christ's sin-bearing death, the guy might later on deal with passages about not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. But not now. To this guy, the church and its behavior is the scandal instead of the real scandal to which Paul, about which Paul writes. The real scandalon, according to Paul, is that we are sinners under condemnation and cannot do anything to make things right with the holy God. The true scandalon is that someone else is going to have to satisfy God's justice for us because we are unable and unwilling to do that. To put it another way, we sinners are in need of a divine mediator. And without a divine mediator, we are doomed. Scripture says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. At the judgment, the law of God will justly declare us condemned. But the gospel is that God the Son freely agreed to die our death for us, suffer our deserved doom in our place. And he didn't just agree from all eternity to do that, he actually did it on the cross, and for free, 
and for each one of us. And the law will be shut up on the judgment day for us, not we being shut up. Romans 5.8. If your friend can see for just a moment that the truth of the gospel does not turn on Christ's church, but only on Christ's resurrection from the dead, it might be the first time he's ever thought such a thought. Will he bend the knee to Christ as his lamb and substitute? Who knows? But you will have done him or her a great service. I wish that all people who were angry agnostics or atheists were clear that it was because they rejected Jesus' claimed identity and his claimed saving work for them on the cross. Believe it or not, that's progress. To reject the good news for any other reason is to confuse what is really the basic claim of Jesus himself as well as the basic claim of all the New Testament writers. I've sometimes said to people, well, you're one of the few I've met who has really rejected the Christian gospel for the right reasons. Congratulations for that. I recommend, though, that you keep thinking about how free and generous Jesus Christ's offer really is, and if it's true, and also that you keep asking the question, was he really raised from the dead or wasn't he? Because if Jesus Christ was raised again from the dead the third day, that is the best reason in the world to believe that he can make good on his claim that his death was a death for you and for your sin, and that his offer of eternal life can really be trusted. Thank you.